Amen. Well, if you're glad to be in the house of the Lord today, say amen. 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 Turn in your Bibles this morning to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. The title of the message today is The Community of Faith. The Community of Faith. Praise the Lord. I still think, think I've got some echo in my reverb. Just a little bit, yeah. I sound decent, but I don't sound that good. All right. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. I'll be reading from the uh, New King James Version. You can follow along on the screen if you're here. Uh, let's all stand in honor of God's Word today. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. The Word says, Therefore we also... Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and has sat down at the right at the at the throne right hand of the throne of God. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you today. That Lord Jesus, you've already run your race. You've already given us an example. And Lord, you have called us Lord into this community of faith. Lord, I want to thank you today for the privilege to be in this community of faith. And Lord, I pray that today that you will open our eyes, Lord, to see the great privilege, responsibility, and opportunity that is before us. Father, I pray that you would touch these here in this place. I pray that you would touch those who are listening in today. Lord, your spirit is not limited by time or space or location. Lord, I pray that today that your spirit will speak to the hearts of your people. And Lord, we know that one word from you can change our life forever. And Lord, I pray that today that you would build your church and may the gates of hell not prevail against it. I pray for those who are struggling, Lord, to find their place. Lord, I pray for those who are struggling, Lord, to be able to get in their place because of issues and problems in their life. I pray, Lord, that today, Lord, that there will be a divine empowerment and connection, Lord, in the community of faith called the church. And Lord, I pray that today the church victorious will march on. And Lord, that we as individuals and we as in our generation will do our part, Lord, in the history of redemption. Lord, to carry this gospel to the ends of the world. And Lord, I pray today for the help of your Holy Spirit who is with us as our helper. Lord, to enable me to speak your word, to enable us to hear your word, and to enable the word of God to become effectual and bear much fruit. So, Lord, we pray the devil be bound in every heart. Lord, every lying spirit, Lord, that would, Lord, oppose the truth, I pray it be bound today. Lord, I pray that the spirit of truth will prevail over every heart, every life, and Lord, to you we'll give the glory from now and forevermore. In Jesus' name, everybody said, Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. As I said, the title of the message today is The Community of Faith. Now, that doesn't sound like a very exciting title. If I heard that title and I came up with that title, I believe, by the direction of the Lord, that title uh, is something that, you know, it doesn't have that, we're going to go out and whip the devil kind of, you know, thing about it. But I want to tell you what, we're a part of something much bigger than we imagine. This community of faith that we call the church is much bigger than you. It's much bigger than me. You're a part of something much bigger. Now, I know there may be empty seats in churches all around our country today. And I understand that there are churches that seem to be dying away. But I want to tell you what, the church of Jesus Christ is marching victorious. 
The church of Jesus Christ is the blood-bought church. Amen? It's the blood-bought church, and Jesus said, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Hallelujah. So this church that Jesus is building is bigger than me, and this church is not going to die when I go on to be to, with glory. Amen? This church we're talking about that Jesus is building is going to transcend every tongue, tribe, people, and nation from every generation Jesus is building His church. Your, this church is bigger than your own family. You're a part of something bigger than where who you go home with today. Oh, I know it's wonderful to go home and kick up your feet and, say, and feet and say, oh, it's wonderful to have a place to go home to. But I want to tell you what, while we're here on this earth, we're a part of a bigger family. We're a part of something bigger than our own family. And if we don't understand that, we're going to miss out on what God has planned. Some people are content to just kind of live on a spiritual island in their faith. Folks, I want to say clearly today, Jesus didn't say I'm coming to build islands for people to stay on. He said I'm coming to build my church. And when you think about what Jesus is doing when he talked about his flock and the church is his flock, he leaves the 99 who were there and he goes and hunts for the one who is missing and he brings them back to the fold. And if you're missing here today, Jesus is on the search for you today. Jesus is on the search for you today because he wants to bring you back into a community of faith. Maybe you've dropped out of a community of faith because you've been hurt. Well, join the crowd. I tell you what, I guess as being a pastor, you learn to just put up with it. You learn to just get through it because if you're going to work with people and if you're going to be with people, even your own family, you're going to get hurt. Amen? You're going to find something that you can criticize and something you can say, I don't like it. Well, I don't like a lot of things about me, but God hasn't given up on me. And I praise God you haven't given up on me. And I haven't given up on you. We're not giving up on each other because God hasn't given up on you. And He hasn't given up on me. He is building His church. And this church is victorious. This church is bigger. This community of faith is bigger than our own church. Thank God for this church. I am privileged to be the pastor of this church. Been here for over 30 years. God has enabled me to be here at this church. But I want to tell you what God is doing is much bigger than what He's doing right here at Grace Fellowship. It's much bigger than any one church in our city. It's much bigger than any one church in our county or in our state or our nation or our world. Amen? In fact, this church, this community of faith is much bigger than our own lifetime. Did you know the church didn't start when you were born? It didn't start when you got here? We are building on a foundation that was laid by the Spirit of God over generations past. This church has come down to us, and God is building His church through the generations. Oh, I tell you what, I'm excited to be a part of something much bigger than me and much bigger than us, and much bigger than our lifetime. People think, oh, the troubles today, I wonder if the church is going to survive. Not only will the church survive, the church will thrive because Jesus is building His church. Amen? You can write it down. The church will not only survive, the church will thrive. Now, there may be local churches that shut down because they re refuse to follow Jesus. But God will raise up a church. He will raise up a church. He will raise up a church. He will raise up a people who will do what He's called them to do and be who He's called them to be. Amen? Hallelujah. And we are a part of that community of faith. Turn to your neighbor and say, I hope you enjoy me being in your community of faith. That community of faith Faith, as I said earlier, is called the church. Jesus said, Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church. It's Jesus' church. It's not your church. It's not my church. It's not the Pope's church. It's God's church. It's Jesus' church. Amen? And it spans every nation around our globe today. It's 
growing in Africa. It's growing in India. It's growing in China. It's growing even in North Korea and South Korea. It's growing in South America. It's growing in Mexico. It's growing in the Southeast Pacific. The church of Jesus Christ spans every tongue, tribe, people, and nation. Amen? And this, I want to tell you what, when you get to heaven, you're going to have some Chinese brothers. You're going to have some African brothers and sisters. You're going to have some Indian brothers and sisters. And you're going to have people from all over the globe that are a part of your spiritual heritage. They are building the church just like we're building the church here with, in cooperation with our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the master builder. Amen. Hallelujah. And it spans every age from the time of the creation and Adam and Eve all the way to our present time. There have been men and women, boys and girls and leaders who have been involved in this community of faith. Folks, I have brothers and sisters in Christ that lived long before me. Did you know that if you follow your genealogy, uh, you are related to people you've never seen? They died a long time before you got here, but they are part of who you are. They are a part of how you got here, and without them, you wouldn't be here today. And I want to tell you, we have brothers and sisters in the genealogy of faith that are part of our spiritual family that lived long before we got here. And they were building in cooperation with Jesus long before we ever picked up the sword and the trowel. God was building His church. And He is doing it today through this generation, through you, through me, through us. Hallelujah. This community of faith includes the saints not only on earth right now, but those oh, who are in heaven. Praise God. I'm a part of a church. You go over to Hebrews chapter 12 and you can see it talks about we have come to Mount Zion and we have come to the church. That church, there's a church in heaven and there's a church that's manifest here on this earth. The church is not a building. The church is not a program. The church is a people. Amen. Now we meet in local congregations and we have pastors and we have leaders and we we preach the truth and we preach the word. We are to build disciples, make disciples and preach and evangelize. But I want to tell you the church that Jesus is building is much bigger. And we need to see that or else we're going to lose our perspective on our life. Why we are here, what we're called to do. So many people call themselves Christians, but they're just wandering around in a spiritual wilderness. They're not attached. They're not connected. And they're somehow wondering, what's wrong with me? I don't feel anything. I don't sense anything. God has departed from me. No, I tell you what, when that coal and that fire tumbles away from the fire, guess what happens? That coal begins to cool. But I'll tell you what, there's a fire still burning in the church. And if we'll get connected... Hallelujah. With other coals of fire, which we are, brothers and sisters, as we join together, all things begin to warm up again. Amen. Our soul begins to get on fire again. And we begin to see that the fire begins to rise because we are on fire together. Amen. And that fire is fueled, oh, by the Spirit of God, oh, and the Word of God. Jesus is building His church. Aren't you glad to be a part of the community of faith. I'm, a, I'm excited to be a part of what God is doing. Well, that faith community, it includes heroes of faith. When you think back at, in Hebrews chapter 11, there's a whole list of people who are listed in that what we call the hall of faith. Think about Abel. Abel was a, a guy in the, in the, out in, after the fall. He was Adam and Eve's uh, youngest son at the time. Cain was the oldest son. But he offered up an offering. And because he did it by faith, he was, he was regarded as righteous in the sight of God. And you know, we go on down through the history. We go down through Enoch, who walked with God. For 300 years, he walked with God. And then he simply was not, for God took him. Oh, I tell you what, I'm related to that man, Enoch. He is one of my forefathers in the faith. Then you come on down to people like Noah. Noah found grace in the sight of the Lord. Noah heard the Lord 
Say, build an ark. I'm sending a flood. And Noah built that for the saving of himself and his household. I'm related to Noah in this community of faith. He is one of those one day when I get to heaven, I want to shake his hand. And I want to know these people who are part of my spiritual community of faith and my spiritual genealogy. Hallelujah. You think of Abraham, that pioneer who came out of a land that he was familiar with to a land he had never been to before. Because God had said, follow me. I want to be your God. And if you will let me be your God, I will bless you. And through you, I will make you a blessing in all the earth. And all the earth will be blessed because of you. Folks, I want to tell you today, my father Abraham, I want to see him one day. And I want to thank him because I've been inspired by his faith. I was inspired when I was living in Tulsa, Oklahoma to come to East Texas because of Abraham's faith to leave a place he was familiar with to go to a place that he had not lived before. God wants to do that in our lives today. These are fathers of our faith. You go on to see Isaac. You go on to see Jacob. Jacob who wrestled against the Lord. But God. Oh, God had a plan for Jacob. And you may be wrestling against the Lord today, but God has a plan for you. Amen. And God changed his name to Israel, which is a man who is a prince with God. God can take you from the guttermost and raise you up to the uttermost today. God can take you out of the trash can and bring you into heaven, into the glorious places and the riches of heaven. Amen. Hallelujah. We have others like Joseph. Joseph was a hero in the faith. What about Moses? Moses, little bulrush Moses. You know the one that the parents put him off in the bulrushes to try to save his life. No, his mom and dad didn't save his life. God saved his life because God had a plan for him. Amen? And because God had a plan for God's people, God had a plan for Moses. And Moses was brought out, raised in the very household of Pharaoh. Amen? The one that was trying to kill out the Jews. God raised him up, gave him an education and ability there in Pharaoh's house and turned around and whooped Pharaoh with him. Amen. That's our God. That's the one we serve. Moses is in our heritage. He's in our genealogy of faith. I want to tell you, you may have a family reunion and you may go to it. I encourage you to go and find out your family roots. People doing DNA tests to find out where they come from. I want to tell you what, I have a DNA blood test and it's Jesus all the way. Amen. My DNA is Jesus Christ in me, the hope of glory. Hallelujah. Jesus is is alive and he is living in me. And we are all one blood in Christ. It doesn't matter what color your skin is. It doesn't matter what language you speak. It doesn't matter how young you are, how old you are. Because of Jesus, we are all one blood, we are all one family, we are all one community of faith, and I'm glad to be a part of the community of faith. I don't know why people wouldn't want to be a part of a community of faith. Oh, I understand we're busy today, and I understand we got lots going on today, but there's nothing more important than this community of faith. Because this community of faith is going to outlast football. It's going to outlast basketball. It's going to outlast your career. It's going to outlast your earthly family. It's going to outlast this church building. It's going to outlast everything, this community of faith. Oh, and heavens, even now, around the throne, those people, those saints of old, are gathered around worshiping the Lamb that was slain. Just like we're doing here this morning. Worshiping the Lamb who was slain. What about... Others, like Samuel, that prophet that God raised up to purify a priesthood and to begin to raise up a man like David. David who became the king after whom our Messiah was named. He is the son of David, Jesus Christ. God raised up a David, a hero of the faith who went about and conquered and gained that inheritance that God had promised to Israel. We also see people like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who would not bow to the king's idol. Who would not bow. They would rather burn than to bow. And God has put that kind of tenacity in the community of faith today. If you're a part of this community of faith, you have heroes. You have heroes in your background. You ever tried to find out your genealogy and see if there's any heroes in your background? Someone that was a hero in the military, someone that was some special person? I tell you what, you need not read any further than this book because your life is full of heroes. 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 What about these that did not bow? God, because they would not bow to the king's idol, God brought them out of the fire that the king had put 
them into. And God will bring us out. Our God is bigger. Our God is greater. Our God is awesome. And there are people of faith who have stood for their God throughout the generations. And we need a generation today that will stand for their God. Amen? Hallelujah. You say, well, where is the God of miracles? God's saying today, where are the people who will believe me? Just like the people that once walked in those miracles. People are saying, where is the God of Elijah? And God's saying, where are the Elijahs of God? You see, you, you think, well, I'm nobody. That's what all of these people said. Moses said, I can't speak, God. you got the wrong person. You have people like, uh, like those who, Gideon, who said, God, you know, I'm just the least in my tribe. I'm the least of all. God said, you get up. I'm going to use you to break the hold of the Midianites off of my people. You see, God is not concerned about how good you are and how powerful you are. All you got to know is that you need a powerful God. And when you have faith in Him, in this community of faith, oh, I tell you, you too can rise up and do the deeds of that community of faith that's gone before you. Look at their example. Look at their faith. Be inspired by it. And know that you're part of it. You're part of it. What about Daniel? Daniel in the lion's den. Hallelujah. God rescued him out of the lion's den. They didn't eat him and devour him that night. The next day, the king threw his enemies into it and they, they devoured him before they ever hit the ground. That's the kind of God that we serve. Amen. Shut the mouths of lions. Rescue us out of the fiery furnace. That's the kind of God we serve. Those are the kind of heroes of faith. What about the Lord Jesus Christ? What about Esther? What about the 12 apostles? Oh, I want to tell you, what about old Paul? Paul, who saw the light. You know, we sing that song, I saw the light, I saw the light. No more in darkness, no more in night. You see, Paul saw the light, and one day you saw the light too. You see, that's how we all get into this community of faith. We see the light. We were once in darkness. We were bound by our sin. But one day the light of Jesus came in. And when the light of Jesus came in, we were born again when we believed. And we became a part of this great family, the community of faith, the church. This triumphant church that's marching on through the centuries. This church is marching on. Hallelujah. I hope today you're understanding that your identity is not found in this world. You're going to be a miserable person as long as you're trying to make this world your home. As long as you're trying to impress other people. As long as you're trying to make other things the source of your joy. And I tell you what, there's lots of things God gives us here, but don't ever let them replace who Jesus is in your life. Don't ever let them replace the reality that you're a part of something bigger than yourself. You are special in the sight of God. No more special than anybody else, but you are special in the sight of God. God loves me. God loves you. And you know the thing about God is as many children as He has, He makes us all feel like we're an only child. We get in our real prayer closet and it's just me and God, me and Jesus, me and the Holy Spirit. And I tell you what, I think I'm the only one God knows about at that time. God has a way of making me feel special in my prayer closet. But I have to remember, when we go to the church, I'm a part of a family. I'm a part of a family. And I tell you what, it's good to be at the table of the Lord. The Lord prepares a table for us every Sunday morning when we get together. We come in and we sit down at that table. We sit down and we feast upon the riches of God's grace. And we are able to fellowship with one another. And I want to tell you, there's nothing more awesome than being a part of a spiritual family who is dedicated to that purpose. Amen? Now you think of all those heroes throughout church history. Think about people like John Huss who was burned at the stake with his books because he dared go against the Catholic Church. He tried to get the gospel out to the people. And he made a prophecy. You may burn me here. That, that word Huss, John Huss in Czech meant goose. You may burn the goose now. But in a hundred years, the swan's going to sing. In a hundred years, the swan's going to sing. And a hundred years later, Martin Luther came on the scene. And he nailed his 95 Theses to the door of Wittenberg. And the Reformation began. Hallelujah! The swan began to sing. And I want to tell you what, your goose may be cooked, but God's going to bring out a swan singing out of the fire. Amen? Hallelujah! Oh, Martin Luther, who would not bow down to the Catholic Church and who would not 
succumb to this ritualistic thing. And he said, the just shall live by faith. And if it hadn't been for someone standing their ground like that, folks, me and you would still be trying to work our way to heaven. But thank God someone was willing to say, I'll die before I'll recant. If I die, I die. But I'm not going to recant. Because if I recant, that is to go against God. And I want to tell you, I may die at your, at your hand, but I'm going to live at the hands of my Savior. We need to understand these are the kind of people that make up the fabric of our faith today. Be encouraged. You are a part of an overcoming faith community. And don't let the devil lie to you anymore. Don't let the devil try to tell you you're just a, part, you're just a nobody and there's no, you're not going anywhere. You are a part of this community. What about people like Jonathan Edwards? What about John Wesley who preached the gospel on horseback all across this land what about people like Billy Graham what about people that are preaching the gospel right now in other lands we don't even know their names but we are a part of this faith community and I know people try to separate us by denomination they try to separate us by being Baptist or Catholic and all these different things but I want to tell you what if you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you're trusting in him and him alone to be your Lord and Savior and you believe this gospel, I want to tell you, we are family. We are family. Not every church has got their doctrine right. I've changed my mind on several occasions. Because as you read this book, you'll realize that God's smarter than you are. And things that people told you aren't always true. Amen? People are mixed up. I've been mixed up. But thank God this book will get us unmixed up. This book will get us back on track. And that's one good thing about the church. Even if the church gets off track, if it'll get back to this book... If it'll get back to this book, I tell you what, if you were on a desert island, didn't know anything about the church, you'd never been to church, you could pick up this book, get saved, and start a church right there. This book is like the, the original copy of what the church is. We get right back to business, amen? That's the wonderful thing. That's why the devil hates this book. That's why people throughout church history burned these books and killed people who translated the book into the language of the people so you and I could read it. Because without this book, we would be in darkness. We would be in ignorance. We would not know that what people are telling us is a lie. But thank God I have a book that will keep me on track. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Give the Lord praise today. What about those other people of faith all around you living? What about those Christian moms and dads? Those that brought you up in the way of the Lord. I thank God for my Christian mom and dad. I thank God for my Christian grandmother and grandfathers and great-grandfathers and those who went before me, who stood firm in their faith, who served the Lord in their generation because I'm a product of that. I didn't get here by myself. God began to move in me because he planted seeds in me through prayers and teachings by my parents. An example, too. Don't forget the example, by the way, moms and dads. Oh, I tell you what, people a lot of times say, do as I say, not as I do, but those little kids are watching you. Amen? They're watching you, and they'll bring it back up to you when you don't do as you say, too, won't they? Oh, kids are a good reminder. Kids are a good reminder. And you need to say, okay, don't say, hey, you be quiet. Do, don't tell me what I need to do. You need to say, you know, you're right. You're right. Daddy and Mama told you this, and we're not doing that, and we're wrong, and God's telling us we're wrong, and God, God got on to me, and so I've got to get right too. Mom and Dad's got to answer to God just like you've got to answer to us. Hallelujah. Kids need to know that there's a higher authority. There's a higher authority, and that authority comes to the parents through God. They need to understand that, that authority comes from God. Hallelujah. What about those Christian grandfathers in the faith. I remember my great grandfather on my dad's side. He was a farmer but a Baptist preacher. A great great grandfather. He was a Methodist circuit riding preacher. I didn't know them that well. I didn't know the circuit riding preacher. But I want to tell you what. I thank God for those heroes of faith. That marched on with, with the gospel. Who preached the gospel. Who laid the foundations and planted the seeds because without those heroes in the faith in their generation we wouldn't be here today hallelujah i wouldn't be in this pulpit preaching and you wouldn't be in this church listening and serving in this church you say what about those elders and those pastors those missionaries those evangelists those revivalists those sunday school teachers those children's church workers those toddler 
workers that are teaching those children there in the church. Oh, this community of faith exists today. Oh, because there have been somebody faithful. Somebody has been faithful to run their race. Did you know that we are in a race? That's what it says here in Hebrews chapter 12. It's called the race of faith. The race of faith. We as a community of faith are running a race of faith. Now this is not a, a race that is just like a, a sprint. We run to the finish line and it's over. This is like a marathon a relay race. And that torch, I have a torch here. I had to make this torch. All right. I hope you like it. But I hope this gets the point across. You know, you ever watch the Olympic the Olympic Games, and they have that Olympic torch, and they run, one guy runs and runs and runs, and then they pass it off to the next person, and they run and run and run, they pass it on to the next person, and they run and run and run, they pass it on to the next person, until finally they come into the arena, and then that Olympic torch lights the big the, a fire for the Olympic Games. I want you to know today, we are running for the glory of God. We are running for the glory of God. God has put a torch. He has put a torch in your hand. You're running this race not just for yourself. You're running this race for the generation before that's coming after you. Daddies, mamas, you're running this race for your kids and your grandkids and your great-grandkids. It's time to realize we can't afford to drop the torch and let the torch drop in our generation. If this generation doesn't get it, we've lost it. If this generation doesn't get it, the community of faith stops in this region. We've got to come to the place today, folks. We realize how important our job is. This torch of faith is with us today, burning in our hearts because somebody passed it down to us. But what are we going to do with it? Are we just going to set it on the sideline and say, Oh, I just want to watch it. Oh, it's a beautiful torch. Isn't it wonderful? Oh, it even has got a little heat in the wintertime. Isn't it wonderful? And just keep it all to yourself. Oh, I tell you what, that's not what God put this gospel in our hands for. This gospel has been put in our hands like a torch to run our race and to hand it off to the next generation. Are you doing that today? You see, the generations before us took it seriously to teach their children and their grandchildren. Are you teaching your children and your grandchildren? Say, well, that's the church's job. No, 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 no. Oh, Abraham, Genesis chapter 18, the Bible t uh, tells us this. God chose Abraham to be the father of faith because he knew he would teach his children and his children's children after him. God chose Abraham because Abraham would pass it on. Oh, God's not looking for people who are going to just hold on to it. God's looking for people ready to pass it on. It's time to pass it on. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's time to pass it on. You see, if we don't pass it on, the reality is we are one generation away from being a pagan generation. We are one generation. Now, folks, we're, we're way on our way right now of being a godless generation. There are some states in our union that are becoming a godless state. They don't even want God. They're banning Bibles and they're banning uh, God in everything. Things that, in fact, they're trying to... Over in California right now, they're trying to pass a bill that says that anything that is spoken against certain things is going to be called hate speech. I'm talking about homosexuality, transgender, things like this. And that means even churches will be under scrutiny if some people have their way. Folks, I want to tell you what. We need to let the, that, that a torch go on to this generation. The reason we're in the shape we're in is because somebody is dropping the ball. Somebody is dropping the ball. And nobody intends to. It's just that we're so busy, 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 busy. We are so distracted, distracted, distracted. We have so many other priorities that seem to be more important. And the thing is, is what good is it to have a nice home and then have the whole system collapse and you have nothing? Why do we have what we have? It's the blessing of God. And if we don't honor the Lord, it'll all be gone. It'll all be gone. We need to understand what the important things are. You see, in the old days, the churches took seriously their need to disciple new converts. Oh, they did it through Sunday school. They did it through different methods, different ways. 
but it is the responsibility of the church and the responsibility of us as families to do it. Let me just read a few passages of Scripture very quickly. Psalm 102, verse 18. It says, This will be written for the generation to come, the generation to come, that a people yet to be created may praise the Lord. He's saying, look, we're writing some things down right now that may not mean a whole lot right now, but they're going to mean a whole lot to the generation that's going to come so that they too can praise the Lord. Psalm 78, verse 4. We will not hide them from their children, telling to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and His strength and His wonderful works that He has done. Psalm 145, 4. One generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. Hallelujah. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 through 9. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit down in your house and when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. You shall bind them as signs on your hand. They shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. I want you to know what he's saying there is, the, is life is a classroom to teach your children about God. It's not take them to church every day when you get up. Everything that you see on TV, everything that's going on at school, things that are going on in their personal aggravations of life is an opportunity in God's classroom of faith to teach your children the ways of God. To teach them the ways of God. And it says, write them, put reminders. Maybe you're not putting them on your doorpost, but we hang up pictures on our, in our house. They have scriptures on them, amen? They're reminders. We put them in the bathroom. You can't even go to the bathroom without reading the scripture. Amen? We do that here at the church too, amen? We try to get the scripture in people however we can. Because, folks, God is going to work through His Word. We need to get that Word in them. Proverbs 22, 6, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Hallelujah. Train up a child. Isaiah 38, 19, The living, the living man, he shall praise you as I do this day. The Father shall make known your truth to the children. Dads, it's not just the mamas and the grandmas' responsibility to teach the kids the Word of God. In fact, in the old days, it was the men who did it. It was the men who taught their wives. It was the men who taught their children. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14 and 15. The New Testament. Let's get there. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing that from whom you have learned them. This is Paul talking to Timothy. And that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. You see what he's saying? He's saying here, he said, you've been in the Holy Scripture since you was a child. It's in you, you know it, and God's going to use you because the Word's inside of you. Folks, there's people right now that are sowing the Word of God in their kids, and God's going to use them because the Word of God's in there. If you put other stuff in there, there's nothing to draw out of. Oh, I tell you what, people are wanting their kids to play game, these video games and want them to watch all these, these movies that have nothing to do with God. In fact, they're, they're really kind of witchcraft. They're all kinds of stuff that's taking away from the truth of the Bible, and they're wondering why their kids, when they get up old enough, don't want to follow Jesus. They, they don't have it in them. They don't have it in them. They grew up in the church. They grew up in a Christian family, but that was not their faith. It was not inside of them. Folks, we failed to pass the fire of the faith into our children. We need to pass that fire of the faith down to the next generations. Ephesians 6, 4. And you, fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath. In other words, don't aggravate your children by just silly things. He said, but bring them up in the training and the admonition of the Lord. Our priority, fathers, is to make sure that we're bringing up our kids in the training of the Lord. That's not just teaching, that's showing them how to do it. That's being an example. It's not just dropping your kids off at church. It's bringing your kids with you. It's not just telling your kids, here's a Bible, read it. It's read that Bible to your kids. Amen? It's not just, you know, go through the motions of religion. 
It's talking about walking it out every day, praying at your table before you eat your food. Oh, it's as simple as that. It brings a reminder. Oh, I tell you, it's wonderful to watch these grandkids begin to get it. At first, they don't understand it when they're little. You said, okay, we're going to pray over the food, and they're just they're ready to go after it. They don't know anything about it. But now it's gotten to the point, with Joshua anyway, that when we say, okay, we need to pray, he looks up and he goes like this. He hadn't learned to close his eyes yet. He does every once in a while, but he knows, and he knows when it's getting close to amen too. Because when it's getting close to amen, those hands come down, and he's ready to go for it. I tell you what, that's training them up in the way they should go. Training them up in the way they should go. Don't wait till they get 18 and say, hey, you need to pray over your food. Amen? You need to bring them up in the faith by determining which shows they're going to watch on TV and tell them why. We had rules over what shows you could watch and not watch on, in our home. What music you could listen to and not listen to. Oh, they would have a fit. Well, it's better to... <laughs> it's really better for them to have a fit and get over it than go to hell with all that junk inside of them. Amen? It's time to have some real life talks and, and deal with them. Why do you like that music? What's going on inside of you? Do you understand what's going on, what Jesus did for you? You've got to get real. It's time to get real, folks. It's time to get real with the next generation. Hallelujah. So in response to the word today, what are we going to do? First of all, remember that you're a part of a community of faith. Remember, rediscover your identity. Rediscover your identity. You see, you're never going to be at home in this world if you're a Christian. You might as well stop trying to impress people. You know, people spend their life buying things they don't need to impress people they don't like. Right? They spend their life trying to get certain degrees and going through certain things and getting certain toys and because when somebody sees them and they don't have the best, they're going to think less of them. They don't wear a certain design on their clothes. Folks, I want to tell you, we need to get over all that. Amen? It's costing you way more money than you need to spend. You're living way beyond your budget and you're not, you're not impressing them anyway. You might as well just... Get used to living a life pleasing to God. Amen. Hallelujah. And a lot of those others wish they could be just like that. Amen. Hallelujah. How many of you ever lo loved to go see your grandma and grandpas and all, and you know it wasn't anything fancy? wasn't anything fancy about them, but you know they were lived long enough, it didn't matter whether it was fancy. It was just real. It was just real. And, and you know, they could play games with sticks if they had to. Amen. They could... They could show you how to have fun without video games. They weren't out to impress anybody. We had more fun doing those kind of things than we ever had trying to do all the stuff the world said you had to have to have fun. Amen? All right, so remember that you're a part of a faith community. Rediscover your identity. Secondly, recall the faith of those who went before you. You say, well, I don't know any. Read Christian biographies. Read Bible biographies. Read through. Find out who the heroes of faith. Read your Bible and learn about these people. Learn about your heritage. Learn about the heroes of faith. Be inspired by them. Amen? Remember their words. Remember what they spoke. Revisit the altars of their worship and what God spoke to them in those places of worship. Oh, recount their battles and the victories that God gave to them as they trusted in God when they were up against insurmountable odds. You see, we need to follow their faith. You think, I don't have anyone to follow. Follow the faith of those who've gone before you. Follow their example. Folks, these people weren't perfect. None of the people are perfect. You're not going to be perfect. But you can follow a faith of someone who's been through the fire. They've been tested. They've been tried. They've been proven. And the outcome of their faith is they stayed with God through thick and thin. In good times and bad times. In sickness and in health. They took God all the way to the finish line. Amen. And God brought them through. And then take your place in this community of faith. Don't be a spectator. Don't be a spectator. You can be a spectator watching it online. You can be a spectator sitting in a chair. Just watching it 
and going out saying, wasn't that a beautiful message? And it's just like another song. It just played, you said, wonderful music, and go off and think, okay, now it's turn to channel and listen to something else. That's what a lot of Christians do. Don't be a spectator in your faith. It's time to become a faithful part of a faith community called the local church. Oh, I tell you what, so many people are missing out on that today. Don't miss out on being a part of the local church. Connect yourself to pastors and leaders who faithfully follow biblical doctrine and are a good example for you to follow. Listen to Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7. Remember those who rule over you, who has spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. Oh, I tell you, God, God wants not only for us to follow them, one day he wants us to be one of those that others can follow. And it's just like the son who the father said to him, son, we're out here walking in the pasture. You need to, walk where, you need to watch where you're stepping. He said, daddy, you need to watch where you're stepping because I'm stepping where you're stepping. Amen. I'm stepping where you're stepping. Folks, there's kids, they're stepping where we're stepping. We're telling our kids, watch where you step. Watch where you go. And they're going, I'm watching you, Daddy. I'm watching you, Mama. Amen. Amen. Pass down the torch to the next generation. You see, we can't afford to drop the torch. We can't afford to just sit there and let the gospel miss our families, our grandkids, our children. Some of you have already, let's say, messed up with your kids. Work, can, continue praying for your kids. Work on your grandkids in the process. God can reach your kids through your grandkids. You put the faith in your grandkids. Amen? Amen. Spend time. Put, them in, put it in there. We must become a generation that's deliberate in our commitment and efforts to teach the next generation. We can't just think about it. We need to think about ways to do it and then follow through with those ways. At home, how are you going to do that? Moms and dads, do you have any way? Do you have a plan to do it? It's time to come up with a plan. It's time to come up with a way to transfer that faith down to the, the next generation. In the church, are we ready to disciple new converts? You see, to disciple new converts, it means they're going to have to have some spiritual moms and dads to come alongside these spiritual babies. That means that once we begin to, to get serious about transferring the faith, we're not going to be thinking about what am I going to get out of it anymore. Because we've gotten something out of it already. Our job is not to get more. Our, get, our job is to pass on what we've already got. And you know, if we'll start passing on what we already got, God will give us more. God will give you more. He does it with me. The more I preach the word, God gives me more. And I tell you what, if I stop preaching, I think I'd stop learning. If I stop Getting in there and digging. I'm going to stop learning. I tell you what, I, I don't preach to you everything I, I've seen. You say, praise the Lord for that. <laughs> you keep giving. God will keep giving back. Amen. We must redeem the time. We need to think of ways in our church when these little kids come in. How are we going to redeem the time with these kids? We've already lost some time with them. They've come right out of the world. They've already... Harry Potter's already got a hold of them. Amen? So I like Harry Potter. I wonder if Jesus would like Harry Potter. Do you read the Bible? You think the Bible might help them a whole lot more than Harry Potter? What's Harry Potter going to teach them? Sorcerers? Witches? Spells? Is any of that going to help them? In their spiritual walk, no, it's going to take them down a, a path and open their eyes to the dark realm of Satan. I didn't get much amens on that, but I tell you, it's time to start thinking about this. It's time to start thinking. We're, you don't want to be the cause your kids go to hell. You don't want to be the cause that they didn't get the gospel. Mom and dad, I'm burning in hell. Why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you tell me? Well, I took you to church. You didn't tell me that church wasn't going to get me there. We must redeem the time. We must renew our efforts. We must help them identify with the community of faith because, folks, there's kids walking out of our churches when they get in college and they're leaving the church behind. They're never stepping back in because, see, they never got it. 
They never understood they were a part of a community of faith. Because they didn't understand that, when they left, they, they left mom and dad's house, they thought, well, we leave the church too. Because they didn't get it. And now they're wandering around there in a wilderness, not knowing who they really are. But for praise God, God's going to bring them back. Keep praying for them. 2 Timothy 4, verse 6 through 8. For I'm all, This is Paul at the end of his life. He says, for I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand, meaning he's going to die. He said, I have fought the fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Paul was saying this, I have run my race. I have kept the faith. And I have passed it down, Timothy, to you. I have passed it down to other pastors and leaders. I can't stay any longer. My flight's ready to take off. My life is coming to an end. But that faith that kept me this far will keep you also, Timothy. It's time to take hold of that torch. Paul said, I have run my race. I have kept the faith. And I have finished the race. It's time for us today in our generation to say, I will run like those before me. I will keep my eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of my faith, who for the joy set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame. And what is the joy before Him? It's you, it's me, it's us, those on the other side. When that torch gets to them, the light of the gospel shines upon them and they become part of the reward of Jesus when they taste of this great salvation and know Him just like you have known Him. Don't hold back. Don't just sit the torch on a shelf. It's time to run that race and light the fires everywhere you go. Amen? Light the fire everywhere you go. And let them run. Let them run. Let them run. Don't wait till they get old. Let them run in their generation for the glory of God. Amen? Hallelujah. Well, let's take up that torch and let's run. Let's run this race that's set before us. Amen. This church, the community of faith. Oh, reconnect. Reconnect. Because this church that Jesus is building, this community of faith. Oh, it's a glorious church. And Jesus is coming back for a glorious church. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you today that we are a part of this community of faith called the church. We are a part of a community of faith that spans the globe. It spans every nation, tongue, tribe, people, and nation. It spans ages past from the first men, women who believed you and held on to their faith through the fiery furnaces, through the lion's den, through all of the trials. They held on to their faith and they passed it down faithfully to the next generation. I pray, Lord, that today that we will take up the torch and that we will run this race. For there is a great cloud of witnesses in heaven waiting for us to run our part of the race. Father, so that the meaning of their race will not be lost. Father, I pray today that we, Father, will embrace the race and run it for the glory of God in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Is God speaking to your heart? Has today's message been something that's caused you to think and reflect about where you are with God? Maybe you don't know Him as your Lord and Savior. If you were to die today, do you know that you would go to heaven and on what basis? 
Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. We're not going to get there through religion. We're not going to get there through church. We're not going to get there through all the works that we try to do to make us good. No, our works are as filthy rags in the sight of God. The only way into heaven is through the cross of Jesus Christ, what He did for us when He died for your sin and my sin. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world, and that's you, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes on Him will not perish and have everlasting life. Do you want everlasting life? Do you want to be saved? Do you want to know that you're on your way to heaven? Do you want a relationship with God? Today, if you will believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is truly the Son of the living God, that He died on the cross for your sin, that He rose again, that He ascended and He's coming back, if you're ready to receive Him as the Lord of your life, today, just simply call upon His name. Get on your knees. Open your heart to Him with humble adoration and confession and receive Him as your Savior today. You say, is it that simple? Yes, it's so simple a child can receive it. But today is the day of salvation. Don't wait another week. Don't wait another month. You never know when the last breath that you'll take will be. If there are other areas of your life that you need prayer, we invite you to go to our website, gracefellowshiprusk.com, and send us your prayer request. If you're away from God, you once were in church, but you've gotten out of church, you've gotten away from God, let God heal your heart. You feel the Lord drawing you back today. Now is the time to say, God, I'm getting up and I'm coming back home. I'm getting up and I'm coming back to my God and my Savior. I encourage you to get back in church. I want to invite you to join us here at Grace Fellowship. We hope you'll come. And let today be the new day in your life where you'll begin that journey with God that lasts forever. Thank you for tuning in. God bless you.